Um, I'll start by talking about uh, basically what the legal ba basis of the decision is, and then um, we can talk about some of how, how it plays out in terms of religious freedom in the culture as well. Uh, Justice Kennedy's decision, uh, he wrote for a 5-4 majority, as of course you all know, was based uh, fundamentally on the idea of substantive due process and the fundamental right to marry. Now, I, I, I actually would agree with him that there is a fundamental right to marry. Uh, it's something that has been recognized by a lot of cases, and most famously in, in Loving versus Virginia, uh, where anti-miscegenation laws in Virginia, the state of Virginia were struck down. However, uh, Justice Kennedy does get it wrong because he, as he actually acknowledges all the court's cases that talk about a fundamental right to marriage take as a presupposition that marriage means a, a union of a man and a woman. And it, it's dangerous when we re redefine the terms of the that we're actually dealing with because you can easily shift the meaning. So for example, if we were to take the, we have a freedom to, of speech, and we define speech to mean something else, and suddenly we have freedom to something else. Uh, all, all of these terms have to, have to carry actual content. So um, the, the challenge here is that he redefined the term marriage in the process of uh, attempting to uphold the fundamental right to marry. The way he did so is, is by pointing to, looking at some of the cases the court has decided previously, and intuiting four principles from those cases that he viewed as central to this uh, institution of marriage. One is that it was an expression of individual autonomy through personal choice. One is that it was a unique two-person union that gave particular, particular importance to individuals. Uh, the third was that it safeguards children and families and particularly draws on the, the rights of child rearing, procreation, and education. And then the fourth is that it forms a keystone of our social order. Now, th there are undeniably themes of all of these in, in the previous Supreme Court literature. However, uh, Justice Kennedy uh, seems to, to completely cherry picked which uh, principles he looked at with the one goal in mind of coming to his conclusion, which is, look, all of these central features of the fundamental right to marry, doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, when woman versus uh, versus a same-sex couple, and therefore, the fundamental right to marry isn't really defined by that. But unfortunately, when you assume, he, by, by assuming the conclusion already, he chose the principles that would support it. It's interesting also to see that he didn't actually, in my opinion, choose those principles to overlap perfectly well, because he does cite to the print, the uh, rights of child rearing, procreation, education, and it is simply uh, difficult to understand how a, per a particular right to procreation uh, has nothing to do with an opposite, opposite sex union when that's obviously how procreation happens. So um, it, the, there's a real problem with, with Justice Kennedy's kind of bait and switch on this. Yeah, he, he takes it, things that are really there as part of the definition of marriage, isolates only those, and not even only those, but mostly only those that, that, that don't have an obvious connection to the opposite, opposite sex couple union then, and then says, well, look, marriage doesn't, isn't really about um, a male-female union uh, that's procreative. It's really just about two people having, having a, a unitive relationship. Um, finally, it, additionally, after, after deciding under the due process clause that this is a fundamental right that is being denied, he then claims that the Equal Protection Clause is also implicated. It's true that the court's discussion of the Equal Protection Clause and, and due process liberties are very uh, intertwined and, and can be confusing at times, but he didn't follow a traditional Equal Protection Clause analysis, which is to say, what is the level of scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause? We know that when we look at traditional Equal Protection law, there's different levels of scrutiny we can give. Certain, certain distinctions you're making require strict scrutiny, so it's very hard for government to make any distinctions, for example, on the basis of race. Others have in intermediate scrutiny, for example, on the basis of sex. There's certain things where there are sexual differences that the government can take into account, but there are others they can't. Um, he didn't talk at all about what level of scrutiny he, he, we should be giving, so that, I think, is a line of cases we're going to see coming out of this going forward. And then to talk quickly, there were four um, major dissents in this case. There were four dissenters, and there were four dissents that were written, and they all sort of tended to join each other's dissents in the process. Uh, for, uh, in large part, all the dissents touched on upon a few major themes. One is the decision simply as a legal matter is not correct. Uh, that whatever your your policy views on the issue, and I and I, I actually would wager that even among the dissenters there may be different policy views on whether or not they would vote in a referendum or vote for a politician who would say, I want to uh, to create same-sex marriage. Uh, I think they, they may come out differently on that, but I think they all agree that 
as a legal matter, the Constitution is not where that happens. The Constitution is completely agnostic as to how marriage is defined. And if anything, it, 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 the Windsor case it's, it, that, uh, that happened a couple of years ago that Justice Kennedy wrote got it right on this point that the states have traditionally defined marriage law, and, at least, and certainly for state purposes, states should be able to do so. So that's one feature of the dissents. Another is talking about concerns about the democratic process, concerns about the 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 way that this the decision was reached and how that undermines uh, the ability to have this debate in the public sphere. So it, it, we we were all talking about this issue. There were a lot of referenda. There were there were state laws. There were constitutional amendments proposed both on both directions in different states, and that has been cut off by this decision. Justice Kennedy alluded to that. He basically said, "Well, look, there's all sorts of amicus briefs. There's been a lot of we've had this discussion. We're done. We're good, good enough. Um, time's up. And now I'm, we're going to make the call. But I think the dissenters would have said the court doesn't get." to be the one that makes that call of now you've had you've had enough talking uh, when it's an issue that the constitution leaves open even if even if you feel like you're sick of hearing the debate you don't get to to cut it off um, and then finally, and I think some other people of the, of the panelists are going to talk about this, all of the dissenters really highlighted their concerns about religious uh, freedom coming out of the decision. The, uh, Justice Kennedy's decision did allude to uh, the, the, the fact that, as the Solicitor General really said, this is going to be an issue uh, going forward. But um, it's taking things out of the democratic process does mean that now uh, our backstop is the courts. We have our First Amendment protections, but it's the courts that are going to do it. And to highlight, since Justice Thomas is sort of my favorite justice on the court for, for reasons that should be obvious, having worked for him, he's a wonderful man, um, as well as a very principled judge, uh, I think he, he pointed out really two important errors in the decision. There are in two inversions they make. First, it assumes that dignity is something that's confirmed, that's, that's conferred by the government. But in fact, if we look at our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution itself, dignity is presumed to be innate. Uh, to either come from our creator, if, if one goes to the Declaration of Independence, or, or even if one is agnostic, to be innate in the human person and not um, not something that the government can confer or deny someone. So even, even for example, while there was slavery in this country, that doesn't mean that those who were enslaved lacked dignity because the government was failing to recognize their dignity. Um, furthermore, he, he pointed out, and some of the other dissents did this as well, the inversion of liberty, that our, our nation and, our, and really the Anglo-American legal tradition has a history of liberty being freedom from coercion, not liberty being a government grant of, of benefits. And that's, that, that was what happened in this case, the idea that the government conferring of the benefit of marriage and the, and the associated uh, benefits is, is actually increasing people's liberty.